Okay, hello. Hi. How's it going? Oh, great. I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to be here. So happy to see you and be here too. We didn't just talk for 15 minutes while the countdown was happening. No. <laughs> Definitely. <not. laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to have Emma Rush back, one of my few returning guests so far. Um, but it's for a very special reason because she has a new CD out today. Um, which is called Wake the Sigh, which she's going to share with us all about. So I'm really happy she's here. And just before we get into talking about the CD, um, my usual spiel, tell me if the audio balance is weird. And also there are links to ch get the album in the description. You can get a physical copy through Emma's website, which is there, or the digital copy through Bandcamp. So if at any point you want to hear the CD for yourself in full, you can do that. But we're also going to hear a bunch of the music here today. So um, I'll let you um, introduce the CD a bit, Emma, since uh, I think we talked enough about you yourself last time. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I have this new CD. It's called Wake the Sigh, and it's a collection of um, sort of quite unusual music from the 19th century written for guitar. And uh, the sort of came about actually um, because I bought a guitar from Mia Drag Sir Donor, mm -hmm. um, Canadian this year. So I bought, in fact, this guitar Ooh. from Mia Drag because we were we were chatting about how he was building these um, copies of Stauffer guitars, and like I was having a great time in this conversation, and I was like, I'll take one, and, <laughs> and then. Um, I actually don't often play that much like romantic music anymore. So I would spend some time sort of thinking about what a good project to do with that instrument might be. Mm -hmm. And then things just kind of fell into place. I was working on a proposal to do this residency in Germany um, with an organization called GayDoc uh, that supports uh, female artists. And um, yeah, so I had this idea to sort of see if there was any music written by female composers in this time period. And there was, well, two composers that I knew of. Um, so I knew about Katarina Patton and I knew about um, Emilio Giuliani Guglielmi. But I had no idea if there was anything else out there. And so I was so fortunate actually to be able to have a couple of months um, living in Lübeck in the north of Germany where I was able to, to vote most of my time just sort of researching this and seeing what I could find. Um, oh, and I'll just mention that that residency was not only supported by GayDoc, it was also supported by the Canada Council for the Arts and the Ontario Arts Council, for which I am totally grateful. Yes, thank you to both uh, organizations for making the project possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so anyways, much to my delight, I found that there, um, there was some other stuff. Uh, from that time period and um, yeah so I think I've found a sort of nice sort of group of composers that are not heard very much so it's uh, for me it's been a really interesting project to sort of sort of discover what's out there and then get to know these composers and their music um, and for a couple of them we have um, like quite a lot of biographical information and then the other five there wasn't much, so I've had to sort of piece little things together, and for one of them I had to do like a bit of sort of primary source research to figure out who she was at all. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it's, um, yeah, this collection all of music by women from the 19th century. Awesome. Yeah, so like I guess you kind of had two hats then, just both, both interpreter and like performer of this unheard, sort of unheard music, but also kind of researcher and biographer. Um, which must have been sort of interesting to do both things uh, for the same project. Yeah. Sorry, to cut you off. <laughs> no, no, yes, yeah, yeah. That's cool. And I, sorry, just really quickly too, I really like this idea of finding not very often heard 19th century music also. I mean, aside from the fact that it's, you know, female composers who uh, probably aren't heard for various reasons that, uh, you know, are far consistent throughout history, but also the fact that, it's music from the 19th century that's not often heard because I think we we often fall in the trap of playing overplayed romantic repertoire as guitarists because we aren't from that time so it's kind of hard to like dig around in there but there's so much that's just not like published and not heard but exists somewhere you know so 
Absolutely. Yeah. What was the experience like researching un sort of unpublished works? How did you find most of the pieces, and how did you sort of? Uh, they were all published. Okay. Um, not sort of currently published. Right. That's uh, what I mean. Like not not available at like you know Long and McQuaid or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Only one piece. Um, yeah, only one piece from the record is, is sort of currently in print. Um, one of the Giuliani tunes, which has actually been um, in print continuously since it was first published, um, which is quite unusual for a female composer from that period. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was, well, I did a couple different things. Like one thing I did was spend a lot of time on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. It's really actually amazing now because so many um, like library special collections have digitalized their archives. Um, so you can actually sort of comb through their catalogs online um, and arrange sometimes to get a uh, sort of facsimile sent to you, which is uh, really great. Awesome. And then I was also able to do some um, on-site visits. So um, I went to the Royal Danish Library in Copenhagen. I went to the British Library in London. Uh, and then I also spent some time at the Bodleian in Oxford. Nice. Um, they have... This is like really interesting. They have um, an enormous amount of music by Katrina Pratton, but some of it they haven't even cataloged yet. Huh. So like I, I sent a list in advance of all the things I wanted to look through, which was like a huge list of like Pratton scores. And then um, one of the librarians there was so helpful and brought me um, a really big box of stuff that had been on a shelf since I think 1986 waiting to be cataloged. Wow. Okay. And so, like, nobody even knows it's there, and I was so lucky to be able to sort of go through it and see all this music that isn't even on their catalog. Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of have this assumption going through school that stuff that we hear is, like, well-known because it was the best or whatever, which is often not the case. I mean, sometimes it's really good, so it catches on for a reason, right? I mean, like, you can't deny that, but... Then things like like the Rogandi etudes weren't known until like not that long ago, and I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, David Sturban who kind of like popularized them a little bit. But even if it wasn't him, it was someone else. But the point is like, until someone sort of digs the pieces up and makes them heard, it's like, you know, even if it's really good, like this Katharina Pratt and stuff that some of the pieces on the CD that I've listened to since I started listening to the CD a day ago, you know, I'm like, oh, I would play these for sure, and I think a lot of other people would too if they'd heard them. So. I think that's like yeah. easily overlooked as a you know student in school is that like the music you play is often just you play it because you've heard it and maybe it's worth doing that for some other people at least at one point in your career you know mm -hmm. yeah so that's really awesome that you guys be part of that um i do it in person but i mean was it a little terrifying handling scores that like old where you're they're the only like you know um yeah, but like everyone else was doing it. Okay, <laughs> so, that's fine. <laughs> no, I just sort of looked around and like everyone else seemed to be like flipping through things and it it wasn't like a um uh you know like secret room with white gloves kind of situation. Most okay. stuff was was able to be handled without any um mm -hmm. like particular peril to the materials. Yeah, but had they made like at least a photocopy of stuff yet or not yet? Uh I don't know. Okay. I imagine, like, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. I would guess they would do at least one, like, scan before letting anyone sort of look through it. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure, though. I mean, some of those collections are just so huge. Yeah. Um, that, like, maybe they don't get a chance to go through every single tune. Yeah. How I'm much, not How much would um, you get paid to be, a, like, the archiver of that stuff? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there was some stuff that was definitely felt like very special. Like, for example, at the British Library, I was um, reading, um, do you know the Giuliani ad? It was, no. uh, I think, like the first English language magazine about guitar. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And it was actually published by Katrina Pratton's father, Ferdinand oh. Pelzer. And uh, so I was just holding a volume of that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like reading this guitar magazine from uh, the 1800s, which just kind of felt like total time capsule. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's super cool. I mean, it also reminds you like that kind of thing of like, you know, her father starting the first sort of guitar magazine and then her writing all this music. It's like a reminder that, you know, the guitar community has always been built up by people who just start things and, try and do things. Um, it's just a shame that her music sort of didn't, hasn't been, you know, really 
widely played until now. Although there are a couple pieces I understand. That's why she's one of the ones you knew before. But um, cool. Well, I mean, I, I think we want to sort of go through during the show and sort of a touch on each of the composers, right? Um, do you want to pick one to start with? What like I think you know the music better than me, so. Sure. Um, hang on, let me check my reference here. Yes. It would also be nice uh, to show the audience some of the music now. Oh, quickly, Ricardo Saeb says, awesome project, Emma. Looking forward to hearing it. Congrats. Thank you, Ricardo. Oh, great. Hi, Ricardo. Oh, and also, I should also say, Ben Diamond said first comment again, as per usual, and I have to acknowledge that Ben did indeed get the first comment, as usual. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um... Well, um, what, do you want to talk about Julia Piston? Sure, why not? Maybe we can play her tune after that. That would be great, yeah, because I want to show people some of this music here. Sure. Um, what do you want to share about Julia Piston, Emma? Well, there isn't actually a huge amount of information about Julia Piston. Um, but what we have, I think, uh, kind of puts together like a quite interesting picture. So Julia, first of all, I don't actually know if that's her, if that's how you pronounce her name. She was active in Paris um, in the 1820s. And it's just not a very French name. Hmm. <laughs> you know, like Julia yeah. Piston, quite British name. And like Julia Piston is not really a super French name. Hmm. So, uh, since I can't find anybody to tell me any differently, and I can't find her, um, you know, sort of records of any, where she grew up or anything like that, I'm going to stick with Julia Piston. Uh, nice. With the that maybe it's wrong. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Gonna... It says on the on the liner notes that she was professor of guitar. Do you know what school she was at? Like, was it a school that's known? Or... Um, I don't think she was out of school. I think she was um, just teaching herself. Okay. Um, but in all her, uh, like her publications, it always says like Julia Piston, professor of guitar. Right. But she, um, okay, so she was uh, mostly, well, we only know about her being active in Paris. And she wrote this sort of huge amount of music for guitar and voice. Hmm. And it's all like, you know, it's quite nice. It's really good. But it's all like puts the guitar in kind of accompaniment position, right? Mm -hmm. Um she also wrote for uh, lyre and harp as well and so we kind of know that she's like a multi-instrumentalist mm -hmm. uh, and then what i think is so interesting though is that she has just a few pieces for solo guitar so she has a couple um she has deux sauteurs which are two little sort of pieces um that are like quite easy to play um, and then the piece that I recorded, it's variations on Viva Cat, which is an old traditional French tune, mm -hmm. um, which has been used by loads of people. It's in a Tchaikovsky ballet. And um, anyways, it sort of shows, I think, like her ambition as a guitarist and as a composer, right? Because we see this sort of, um, you know, arpeggio noodly accompaniments and all the vocal music but then when we look at this piece we can see that she actually had like quite a lot of skill as a composer and i wonder you know if because it was so popular to have guitar and voice music then like you can't overstate how popular it was yeah. wildly popular mm -hmm. um but i wonder if she was being just this very clever businesswoman you know so writing all this guitar and voice music and then following you know, maybe her soul a little bit more with some solo guitar music. Yeah, and maybe she didn't publish some of the solo guitar music she wrote because it just wouldn't sell. So. I know. Oh, it would be so fabulous if we found more. Because yeah. I actually, this piece, um, these variations on Viva Vi Camp, they're, um, I love them. I think they're very moody. And they kind of follow, like, the traditional guitar variations, right? Like, sort of different, you know, a different guitar technique in every variation. But... I think they're, um, yeah, it's like quite a dark and uh, just a very cool piece. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, I, I will have to ask you later about the voice and guitar music if it still exists, even if the guitar is in an accompaniment role, because I'd, I'd like to take a look at it. But also, I was listening to this earlier today, um, 
because I got privileged uh, early access to the album. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I was thinking, like, the coolest thing about these variations to me, or, like, on first listen, at least, you know, I don't know them as well as you, but was that I like that sort of using that old French song as the theme at the beginning, you kind of get this feel that you move from, like, sort of older folk music or almost Renaissance music into the Romantic era, like, of guitar music, you know? So it's kind of this really cool transition, at least, like, sonically to me, it seemed that way. When you first hear it, you almost feel like you're listening to some, something even older than the 19th century, you know? Uh, well, I think the piece was originally published in the late 1500s or something, like, or okay. maybe it was the first mention of it. Like, it's very, very old. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of almost seems like you're listening to, like, Dowland or Milan or something yeah. at first, and then it's like, becomes very much romantic guitar music. Um, yeah. Cool. Nice. Well, let's listen to that. But also, quickly, before we listen to that, I should also mention, I almost forgot... Um, Emma is being very generous and going to give away some copies of the album. So we have skill testing questions for the audience. Um, woo! Woo! So if any of you can answer these questions in the chat, you will get a, cop a download copy, a download link from Emma. You have to harass her after the show. Um, or don't do that, actually. Just, just message her. Um, so the, uh, the first skill testing question is... Uh, in order to get a free copy of the album, is what is the official pub of the Hamilton Guitar Festival? So, if someone can answer what the official pub is, the first person to do so will get a free copy of the album. Um, but let's listen to the uh, Julia Piston piece now. Uh, and I am not going to pr try to pronounce the t title of the piece because my French is terrible. Um, <laughs> okay, let's listen to this piston.
Very nice. Thank you. Awesome. Cool piece, right? Super cool. Yeah. 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 Very nice little finale. Um, also, during the piece, Emily Shaw on YouTube got the skill testing question correct. <laughs> which is the pub that is the official pub of the Hamilton Guitar Festival is Cat and Fiddle. Very good, Emily. Yeah, it is. It is our it is our personal favorite Hamilton pub as well. Yes, true. Very um, true. Yeah, but and Emily just bought my CD already. <laughs> like, <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, so uh, Emily, you can have a bonus copy if you want, or you can um, have a download to give to somebody else. And pass it along to a friend yes so just message emma and she'll send you the link for that um okay. and michael chapdelaine sends us a heart thank you michael nice to see your viewing and ricardo says, puts the clapping emoji so it looks like people enjoy it oh hey richard richard charter is here too also clapping you're getting a lot of d digital applause emma <laughs> the best kind the only kind during covid right yeah <laughs> <laughs> I always feel during like these live stream concerts that I need an applause button. Yeah, <laughs> I should get, I should get one for the show. Actually, that's a really good idea. Yeah, as well as like a laugh track for when my guest makes a joke or I make a joke. Excellent, I love it. Yeah, so I think we were talking. We were conferring during the recording that we would talk about Katharina Pratt's and next, correct? Sure. I love talking about Katharina Pratt. Nice. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, and I love her music so much. Um, so she's one of uh, the composers from this period that we actually do have quite a bit of information about. She was really, really well known. Um, so she was born in Germany and then moved to England with her family at a quite young age. And she was playing guitar like very early on and um, appearing in concerts by the time she was eight. Um, a cute little fact about her is that she used to play concerts with Rigondi. Oh, um, cute. You know, Kinder. <laughs> and there's a really like sweet story about how at a concert they had to put both of the kids like on top of the piano so the audience would be able to see them. Oh. Um, which is uh, just great, I think. <laughs> anyway, so after this, um, sort of her... Uh, childhood, she continued playing concerts and uh, developed like, quite a good concert career. Um, but rumor has it, like she had quite a bit of um, like performance anxiety and was like never quite comfortable on stage. Um, just don't know what that feels like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I can't relate, so you know. Yeah, um, but uh, so she wound up um, sort of later on. Uh, Oh, I should also mention that her husband was a quite famous flute player, Robert Sidney Cotton, and she played with him as well. Although I can't find any like concert programs from them performing together, so if anybody has information about that, like please send it to me because um, I would like to know what that was all about. Uh, anyway, so later on she wound up focusing on her teaching career and her composition career. And she was absolutely in demand as a teacher. She was teaching all of like the fashionable society people. She was teaching um, Queen Victoria's kids. Like she was really, really like... Um, well connected, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely well connected. And she had some other um, like quite prominent students. Um, she taught Dr. Walter Leckie, mm -hmm. who studied with her and then also studied with Tariga. And he was just like a very well known like sort of guitar aficionado and Katrina Pratt and dedicated works to him, so did Tariga. And there's a great book that just came out. It was um uh the it's by Brian it's White House or Whitehead, I'm sorry if he's watching. <laughs> but um about Walter Lucky and Tariga and Pratton and it has a lot oh, of cool. great um, information and photos and facsimiles of old scores, and letters from Pratt. And it's a really, really great um, resource. What's the book called? Maybe someone in the chat can find it. Um, it's just downstairs on my piano. Um, I don't know what it's called. It's called like Dr. Walter Lecky and Francisco Terraga or something. Okay, if someone in the chat can find it, please put a link for people. That would be cool. Yeah, I can also um, post that after. Okay, nice. So in the comments. Yeah. And if 
there's any other things that I'll just make a little notes actually. So if there's any other things that come up, I'll like post that later. Cool. Yeah, it sounds like it was, she sounds like she had a very fascinating career. Um, and I. Uh, I was about to, when I was reading the li liner notes and you were describing her, I was like, wow, she sounds like Gandhi, Wonderkind, lived in London. And then the next sentence was like, she used to play concerts with Gandhi. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And, uh, and the pieces also, the thing that struck me about them, at least the ones on your CD, is they all have such imaginative names. Um, and a number yeah. of these based on magical sort of mythical creatures. So I was going to ask like sort of, you know, what's the, did she have a thing for like mythical creatures or... It's just these Don't pieces. We all? Don't we all? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. No, um, okay, well, this is really interesting because um, quite a few of her pieces are played, um, well, I mean, I would say often, but that's like relative to never. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of music by um, uh, female composers in the past. Um, but she is one of the composers, like from this collection anyway, that is a little bit more well known. And so there's quite a few pieces. Um, she wrote these like sort of small character pieces um, that were all, it was sort of after her husband died and they have um, like who she deeply mourned for the rest of her life. That was like a big, big deal. But she, these pieces called like Lament, uh, Forgotten, Sadness. And they're absolutely heartbreakingly beautiful. And those ones are all available on that, um, I just, I don't know how to pronounce it. Do you? That collection of guitar music, it's B-O-I-J-E. Boye, 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 I don't know. So it's, it's public domain, it's available online. So you can find those pieces there. So they wind up being played a bit more often. And then we sometimes hear, um, like the Mal Malbra Crentizia, um, like Sor wrote one as well. That's been okay. recorded a couple of times. Um, she so, but anyways, we don't hear like a lot, and so I kind of wanted to record some stuff. First of all, that hadn't been recorded before, but that also showed how she's not just sort of in this like sort of melancholy mood all the time, mm -hmm. sort of nostalgic, sadness, lovelorn <laughs> mood. Yeah, um, but she also like this music that is so so playful and really um really interesting in that way and she also has like a lot of the music that she wrote was for her students and to sort of suit the taste of the day right which is that it was like skilled amateurs yep. so her music is very playable although she does in this music she uses like every trick in the book she also has some of her sort of own technique that she kind of developed uh, you can read about it in her very excellent guitar method, which is available online. Cool. Um, you can find that actually in the Huddlestone collection from it's in Ireland. It's online. Okay. Um, and then her pieces, like even the easy ones, are usually using the whole fretboard, like first to seventeenth frets. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. like because she's just like writing these beautiful melodies. Um, and what I really love about her music is you just. Like her personality kind of leaps off the page, you know, like it just comes mm -hmm. to life so much and you play through a few of her pieces and you, I feel you just really like get a sense of what kind of person she was. Yeah. I like listening to it. I just, it made me feel, it made me feel like listening to Dowland, you know, like yeah. sort of how you listen to Dowland, you feel like you know this person, even from listening to a few pieces, you know? Um, yeah. And it's yeah, it's super imaginative and super lyrical. And I think I actually sight read some of one of her pieces at your house after a few, few beers when I was there for that little tour with Nathan. I think it was one of the pieces I sight read, and it was really fun. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's really nice when a composer you just get the sense that the composer is sort of immediately bearing who they are on the page. You know. Yeah. There's a really wonderful book. It was a set of like reminiscences. <laughs> from one of her students um frank mott harrison is his name you can also find this um like digital copies digitalized copies online um and it's I, I think she was very very generous like with her time and her knowledge with her students um she wrote compositions for them all the time like she seems like she was just a wonderful person as well as being a wonderful composer mm -hmm. and it's it's that i would recommend reading that it's just a beautiful sort of snapshots of what it would have been like to study with her it's really great awesome cool um i'm also i i forgot i, I prepared some questions for each of the composers i think i think i might have missed my chance with julia piston but um because i'm all about you know sort of um 
uh, musicological uh, depth here on the show. I have some like biographical questions for you for each composer, since you're, you're one of the only people who kind of knows these composers like as well as you do since you had this residency. So in the case of Katharina or Sidney Prattson, uh, do you think she would have preferred horseback riding or sailing? Sailing. Okay. Why? Definitely. Well, if you read the book, you would find out. Okay, so I have to read the book. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think because she was so in tune with the elements, you know, she would have found great inspiration right. in, um, you know, the waves, the winds, the sunsets. Sea creatures. She would have written a great sailing tune. Nice. And who is Queen Mab? That's the title of one of the pieces. Oh, um, Queen Mab is in... Um, where is she from? She's from British folklore. Oh, okay. And then Puck as well is, um, so you're asking because there's like two pieces on the record that are a set of fairy sketches. So mm -hmm. those are two pieces from, yeah, English folklore. And then the piece, um, oh yeah, we are going to hear that. But the other piece I recorded was called Kelpie's Dance. Mm -hmm. And Kelpie is a figure from Scottish folklore. Yes, a little water nymph demon. Thing, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, we also have a very special guest today, which we're going to bring on now. Um, I'm going to send the invite to him. Uh, and this is Kirk Starkey, who helped rec or who recorded and produced the record, right? So um, do you want to tell people a little bit about how you met Kirk while I sent him the invite here? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I play in a band with Sara Tapiponte, and uh, Kirk is... Sarah's husband, and uh, so I met him through Sarah, and then I've um, worked with Kirk. Well, he's a cellist, producer, like sound engineer, and like just a sort of all-around incredible musician. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with him on this and my last um, solo album, and then Sarah and I worked with him as well on our two duo records. And um, yeah, and he's done some other guitar guitar recordings as well. But it's a, it's, I just love working with him. Awesome. Cool. And he's, sorry, did you mention this? I was sending the message. He's a cellist, right? He's a cellist. Cool. An awesome cellist. Awesome yeah. cellist. Nice. Um, actually, why don't we put on the Pratton video while we get him in the call and get sorted that way? Is that cool? Okay, yeah. So I wanted, to, we can just mention maybe that this is like a video that's actually from the CD because I wanted to not just have performance videos, but so that um, we could actually hear Kirk's awesome work. Um, cool. <laughs> um, but um, the video that we'll be sort of playing is, um, we're so lucky we have a few portraits of Katrina Pratton. So um, you'll be able to see her from eight years old until a much later portrait. I think she was in her 70s. Awesome, cool. Um, yeah. So this is the actual audio of the CD itself, which Kirk recorded, yeah. which we're gonna talk with him about after. Um, and I also wanted to say Emily Shaw says, yay, would love a bonus copy for a friend. I have a keen student who would love it. So she can pass it on to her student. And Steve Cowan says, sounds great. Hi, friends. Hi, Steve. Oh, and hi, Steve. Hi, Amy Brandon. Yes, hi to Amy. And Dave, no last name. Dave says, I'm late, but I made it. Hello to Emma. Hi, Dave. Um, okay, let's listen to this Pratt and Tune. And which one is this? This is puck number two from her collection of two fairy sketches. Cool. Okay. Sydney Pratton or Katrina Pratton.
Wonderful. Nice. And all three of us are here now. Hi, everybody. Hey, hi, hi. Hi, Emma. Nice to meet you, Michael. Nice to meet you, too. I know this is a sudden, sudden meeting on air. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, we're very happy you're here. Um, and we just listened to some of your work from the CD. Um, Emma already described how you guys met a little bit, but do you want to introduce people to yourself a little bit and uh, talk about your role in the project? Yeah, for sure. I'm the pr producer uh, engineer. I've been um, working with Emma for a few years now. And um, yeah, basically we met in Hamilton and uh, my wife uh, plays in a duo with Emma. So it's uh, we're kind of connected in multiple, uh, multiple ways. Uh, but yeah, that's basically the, the story. Cool. Nice. And how did you get into like producing recordings and, and doing audio work? Because Emma says you're quite deep into that world. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, um, I've been, I've been doing this for, um, 19 years now. Uh, so I started back when I was in living in Italy, uh, I got really interested in, in production and had the chance to apprentice with, um, uh, some top, uh, Swiss tone meisters and, uh, really, uh, piqued my interest in, in the power of doing that. And the original vision was for actually for my own playing and music was to, uh, just, use it as a, as an expressive control for my own, for my own work. And so that's really how I was the initial impetus to, to get started in, in production. Uh, over the years, uh, it became apparent that uh, other people could also use <laughs> the things that I've been, uh, been learning and uh, yeah, I've been, been making uh, records uh, yeah for close to close to a decade now. So it's been uh, it's been a really fun uh, process and a, and a beautiful thing to add to the perf to the performing and uh, I play with a band called Quartetto Gelato and we do a lot of touring in the U.S. or we did uh, pre-COVID and the the idea has always sort of been to that this would uh, you know extend extend my my musical career and and uh, there would come a time when touring would be less uh, enjoyable and that uh, that this would become uh, sort of the main uh, portion of my career with, with with COVID now this is now I mean my schedule is now completely filled with uh, with production work uh, so that's kind of worked out quite handily for me uh, I feel I'm very blessed with that but yeah it's it's really at the at the end of the day um, having the chance to work with great artists is always the the name of the game uh, that you know, it's, it's amazing how my recordings improved when I started working with great, <laughs> with great players. So, uh, you know, and, uh, Emma's no exception uh, to that. Awesome. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a, it's a good point to make that it's, it's kind of nice to have different hats you can wear as a, as an artist and have a different creative outlet in recording too. I'm, I'm not anywhere near the, the level you're at, but I've, I've sort of been oh. over, over the last few years learning about recording and editing and stuff and I cool. really enjoy that and I've been doing it for yes. a few other people around my area too and it's it's nice to have something aside from teaching and playing to work on I mean not that you don't have enough to work on as a musician but you know <laughs> yeah yeah no 100 100% and you know at the end of the day there's um I mean different ways of looking at this uh, some people look at the uh the digital uh you know quote-unquote revolution as being bad for audio but i don't look at, at it that way at all like when when musicians are actually working on their own projects and being able to execute uh you know for example their social media offerings uh themselves they learn a lot about how this works and they actually learn a learn a vocabulary and a skill set that actually makes them easier to work with uh you know in the, in the recording process and so i think it's actually a really valuable a skill for people to learn if they have the inclination to do it yeah I was going to ask, what was the most interesting thing about working with guitar like the first few times you did it? Because Emma said that you've worked with James Renwick also, but that you've done her other two yeah. CDs. So you've had a few experiences yeah. now with the instrument. And what's what's that sort of been like? Well, it, it's funny. On, on Emma's first, the first record we did together, uh, the Canadiana, I, I, I feel like I kind of lucked out on that one. Just, I mean, just because uh, we were recording in a really nice room and Emma's guitar is just like a really great sounding instrument. So, um, I mean, guitar is one of those instruments, uh, it, it is very sensitive to microphone placement and does change a lot, uh, you know, how close or how far or where, where you go. It, it's one of the instruments that respond, responds greatly to, uh, to that. Um, 
but in the, in, in the first record, like really got kind of lucky. Just, it was put the mics up and it was like, wow, that's the sound uh, almost just came together. Like in about five minutes, the, the mic placement was very, nice. very straightforward. We, we recorded that with four, uh, four microphones. Um, and yeah, like I would say that, uh, some of the peculiarities of the instrument are that, um, yeah, like the low end of the instrument is is something that that tends to uh, get picked up when, when you're using good microphones. It gets picked up a little more than you might like sometimes, even from a distance. Uh, and so, uh, controlling the low end and the top end for for string noise and fret noise is something that that is very uh, important to guitarists. And and that's something that's been interesting that we're often like sort of just carving away. Uh, at, at, at both the top and the bottom to, uh, to make something that presents the, the and put the focus the energy on the on the uh, on the center of the instrument, um, which is yeah that's that's been probably the most interesting process to learn how uh, different guitars respond uh, and how they record. Yeah, so Emma, the the Canadian was on this the other guitar you usually play, like the one I played when I was there last time, right? Yeah, it's um, a German guitar made by Roland Scharbacher. That's, that's right. a great. That's a great sounding guitar. It I is, love that. Yeah, guitar. I, I picked it up when I was at Emma's a year and a half ago because we had a concert there and that she put on very kindly. And uh, and that guitar has some real power. Like I just remember <laughs> sitting there and yeah. sort of filling the whole room with the sound. Um, but that's very. It's probably quite different than Mio Drag's guitar. So how was that for both of you? Like, did the recording process change much in terms of like how you guys set up and how you navigated the sound moving to this other guitar for, for sure you sh should i answer that or does, yeah yeah th th that's the uh, the, the rom romantic guitar correct yeah the, the yeah. Stouffer copy. yeah yeah so part of the deal with this record was uh trying to capture a uh sound that would you know sort of be more um you know style like stylistically uh, appropriate for mm -hmm. for the salon or is a little, a little more you know, a smaller room and la less, uh, you know, sort of spacious and grandiose. So uh, we opted to record in uh, in the studio and basically uh, just, you know, very, very basic uh, two microphones, um, you know, relatively close mic'd and, uh, and, yeah, just capture an intimate sound. The guitar has uh, much less bass uh, than, than Emma's uh, main guitar. Um, and that... Yeah, also also less top end as well. So that that's sort of working for you. But I did uh, I did work with that a little bit in in post just to bring the sound a little, um, yeah, just a little bit further uh, closer to uh, to a normal guitar because the the guitar was uh, just wanting a little bit in the low end and, and a little bit of air in the, in the very high frequencies. So we we added a little bit back with uh, uh, with some EQ. Yeah, especially with a, a, a room that doesn't um, sort of give anything to the guitar that way. 100%. That's yeah. that's a very good very good observation. Was Emma, was this something that you sort of, did you kind of give Kirk like the direction of what you wanted for the sound of this record that it would be different? <laughs> or was it sort of, an, was it a negotiation or was it just like record it and do what you want with it, you know? Yeah, well, basically, um, well, I have worked with Kirk so much that I really trust his ears and his, um, you know, opinions about stuff like that. And he's like such a skilled engineer. Um, and I also am not very uh, good at talking about sound. So what I wanted was, I mean, what I really like is guitar records that sound like a guitar and that have a kind of like inviting sound that make you feel like you're really listening to somebody playing a guitar. You know, I don't want something like super sterile. And I feel like that's what Kirk does. Right. And oh, it's also, sick. it's problematic too, because I, I know what you mean, Emma, like you kind of want things to sound like you're actually playing, right? But the funny thing is that sometimes when you record yourself, and this is something I've been learning over the last couple of years, and like, especially the last three, four months, I got a pair of Aston Starlights, which were like my first like sort of kind of oh, yeah. nice mics. And um, recording with them the first few times, like even if I place the mic in a good spot, it doesn't necessarily sound like you. And then I did one recording where I finally like, did more work in post and like sent it to my friend Alex Bougie from the Ottawa Guitar Trio to help me a little bit with mastering it. And then Jessica listened to it. And she's like, oh, that sounds like when you actually play. Yeah. And I was like, but 
this is like yeah. more quote unquote doctored, you know. But it's just like sometimes the thing that the mic gets is not the effect you get when you're sitting in the room with the instrument. And of yeah. course, it's never going to be 100 percent accurate. But you're right; like a good engineer is kind of crucial to like helping you sound like yourself, you know. Um, it's very, it's very true. What you say though is, as soon as you put a microphone in something, it, it is already uh, interpreting and, and changing uh, what's there. And especially um, when you're using cardioid microphones uh, that have a proximity effect, uh, this can can really, you know, change uh, radically the low end response. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if it does make a difference when you have the chance to go into a room that uh, flatters and enhances the sound of the instrument, and then and then using um, you know flat omnis uh, to to mm-hmm. capture that sound, it does make a difference. Right. Yeah. And Emma, what was it like recording on this other guitar for you as like from the perspective of being the person in the hot seat in the room, like with this Um, other other instrument, you know? I think, um, I think the difference basically was sort of figured out beforehand in a way, like, cause it, it's sort of just a bit of a different animal to play. So I kind of had to figure out how to not overplay it. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like just the you have to have like kind of a different attack for it. And um, so it's much different than how I play my Sharvatka. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, aside from that, like the, how I felt in the recording studio was just like a disaster, like always. <laughs> like always, goodness. <laughs> I'm glad it's not only me. <laughs> there's, there's... I've never played any of the pieces before. It's, um, it's, funny, it's, it's funny how recording sessions never end in a, a moment of glory, you know, it's always <laughs> grinding out to the last minute (laughs) um nice and i you know i think it like it's 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 awesome uh to find someone who you trust to work with like emma was saying Mm -hmm. that she trusts you because like yeah you know i don't know like i don't know how much communication you two had after the process like in in post kind of but like yeah i you know yeah a lot and i and i'm i'm hoping to record a cd sometime this year and i want to use my own mics but i want to get someone to help me put it all together and, and polish it who really knows what they're doing a bit more and, and I a guy I can recommend. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> fair enough. yes but, but <laughs> the thing i was going to say was like it just it fills me with anxiety choosing someone because you know you got to choose someone who you know you can communicate with and um and and also it must be it must be nice um knowing that kirk has experience with the guitar now so what was it like for you sort of getting to know the guitar repertoire kirk and how to like edit guitar recordings Editing guitar is um, is quite uh, quite straightforward. Any any instrument that has a lot of transients um, with a with you know sort of quick decay um, right. tend tend to edit quite uh, quite easily. So that's uh, very very straightforward. The thing I, I would say just to to your point earlier though about um, you know collaborating, uh, like I, I I I believe very much in the collaborative model when, when producing that that. At the end of the day, I have an idea of what my, you know, what I, what tools and what sound that I'm bringing to the project. But at the end of the day, it's the artist, it's the artist vision, it's the it's the artist sound, mm-hmm. and so that that uh, ultimately the like the the best example is where we uh, work together to find a uh, common ground where it's like we're actually pushing it a bit further than than both of them where where we started, but at the end of the day, the artist has to be on board. And, and I work basically with a, um, uh, I'm, I'm not done until the artist is, is happy. And yeah. uh, I, you know, basically that's, that's just how, how it goes. So I think that's, I that's not entirely true because sometimes I say like, yeah, I'm really happy with this. And you're like, no, we're going to make it better. Yeah. Well, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, yeah, the, that's, yeah, that's true. But you know, Kirk is an artist too, so it's he's yeah. just, it's until both artists are happy, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Kirk here. Um, Kirk, do you guys yes. combine omnidirectional and a room mic? Um. Yes, I. I generally, uh, I mean, it depends the scenario where I'm recording. Like, if we're in studio, I mean, like, what there's, I'm trying to basically navigate or mitigate the effects of the room on the recording and just capture the guitar then typically that'll be a straightforward you know two uh two microphone approach but if i'm in a room that actually um i'm trying to capture uh then you know minimum four microphones and uh usually for for guitar i wouldn't 
want to use more than four mics, but it's, it's possible. Uh, <laughs> depending what, what, we're, what we're trying to do, but yes, like the, and, and that, that, um, combination of, uh, of closer microphones with, uh, you know, with a, um, with a main pair or potentially with even with room mics, uh, that gives you layers of, um, of, you, you know, l layers of sound with which to create a, uh, to create a, um, a spectacle. And, th and that's basically what we're trying to do is create width, uh, and depth and height to the recording that when you turn it on, it, it feels, uh, feels large and wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're also an instrument that has this problem of like when you get close enough to get a really nice sound, you also get all those weird nail sounds and scratching on the strings <laughs> and all this stuff. Yeah. I, I find I find I mean one of the the nice things um, I mean both both uh, Emma and, and James uh, those are on top of my mind because guitarists I've worked with recently uh, are actually not uh, overly uh, f fussy about the, those things, uh, which is which is cool because for me that's all part of the sound right right and and string noise and buzz and all that stuff i don't know i feel like uh just having you know having talked to people and you read stuff online and, and and i get the sense guitars get pretty uh you know um uh, i say preoccupied with those <laughs> with yeah, some yeah. of the sound well actually, and, and, part of the problem is we're sitting next to the guitar so we hear it like we, yeah. we hear more like i keep telling my students when they're always like because some of them like the more self-conscious students they start to hear their first string noise when they're growing their nails and they start mm -hmm. freaking out and i'm like remember yeah. you know you hear this yeah. like yes one foot from the guitar everyone out there doesn't necessarily hear it so yeah yeah for for violin that's actually even worse i mean that's uh like the because i mean that thing produces so much uh spl right directly in the violinist left ear that they uh, they have actually a very uh, skewed picture of how they sound. I feel guitars are a little closer to, right. uh, to reality, but you know, you hear stuff about people, you know, choosing, changing their strings for recording and stuff like that. That does, to be honest, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, uh, in terms of like, if, if you're wanting to change your strings to record like that, we should maybe play with those strings all the time. If that's, if that's your sound, you know, yeah. that, that, uh, that actually make, make make the sound you want to make commit to it and 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 don't be afraid like these these human things are are beautiful you know and they can they can actually really make a, uh make a record feel more more alive for sure yeah i mean the other thing is I, oh, sorry no go ahead emma something that i like about working with kirk is that like i feel like me and probably lots of other guitarists like we can get really bogged down in like very guitar-y things like friggin' around with some slur or worrying about some stupid technical thing but to, like to have somebody that you're working with that is like much more of like a big picture that is about like actually making music and not making slurs yeah um, <laughs> it's like really helpful to have that like oh. um video with you nice. yeah i mean that's that, that's like kind of the best like even when it comes to teachers, like working with Carlo, I appreciated that he was less of a guitar teacher to me and more of a music teacher, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which sometimes you need a guitar teacher when your technique just sucks and you got to fix it. But, you know, at other times you need a music teacher and you can get stuck with someone who's just a guitar teacher and is sort of like, you know, hammering you for that stuff. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And uh, out of all the, the pieces, do you have a favorite that was your favorite to work on, Kirk? Or what was what were the pieces that were a pain and what were the pieces that were really nice to work on? <laughs> Oh, I, I've seen this repertoire was quite delightful. The whole, the whole disc. Um, yeah. I mean, I have to say that the Giuliani's were, were cool. Uh, I mean, I thought that was uh, probably in, ter in terms of, um, yeah, I mean, I probably have to le be leaning toward the Giuliani. I know that's sort of the, that's more of the more well-known repertoire, right? Yeah. 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 But Sorry. I mean, just like some that's things it. are kind of fun to edit and some things are a pain, even if you love listening to them, you know, like it's sort of. Yeah. Well, did these this whole record was done in one take so those oh, nice. uh, yeah. awesome yeah. perfect yeah sorry we yeah. don't need to talk about editing your mistakes at emma on air yeah <laughs> no there's very 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 little editing uh needed the um but yeah no that that's just part of the editing is is technical but it's also um artistic right and so exactly we, yeah. we, we take together what what we have uh and try to see what's possible yeah, yeah i mean i i don't even I, th I think it should be viewed as like another part of the artistic process in that sense because like i I recorded one of the emilia giuliani prelis recently and i had a take that was good from the start to the yeah. end but i still ended up using four different takes because i liked the arpeggio and this one section yeah. i really liked the rubato i did and this other yeah, section, yeah, yeah. so it's like yeah. it's not about the player being not good enough or something it's just about you know that artistic choice 
Well, this happens regularly. I, I do a lot of things for for broadcast and and working with other composers on my cello, and and oftentimes like you know experimenting with bowings and and you know I'll have several takes, and and sometimes when you're able to, sp to put these things together in a way that's like wow, that's really difficult to do <laughs> like that for real, you know. And then it actually gets you thinking about how how you phrase and what's uh, you know how to how to do things better. Nice, cool, mm -hmm. um, awesome. Well, and was there anything that was your least favorite thing to record, Emma, even if you liked playing it? Or your most uh, favorite thing? Well, um, I guess the only sort of, like, the real tricky thing about this record is that some of the pieces sound, like, really charming and light and, like, they're really easy. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not. Yes. Yeah. It's so, like, technically complicated. Uh, but, like, the end result, I hope, like, doesn't sound like that. <laughs> Right. So it's the worst. Uh, it's the worst combination. It sounds easy and it's actually really difficult. You want the you want the opposite. <laughs> yeah. I feel that way about sore. Like whenever I give sore pieces to my students, I play it for them, and they're like, "Oh, that sounds like simple." And they'll always choose it over like the Karuli piece, which sounds really flashy. But it's actually like ten times harder because you don't just have a bunch of like C major G seven arpeggios. You have like some really weird messed up voicing that causes your left hand to like have an aneurysm. So <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling um yeah mm -hmm. nice well um yeah kirk is there anything else you want to add or ask uh emma or talk about or um i mean just it was a great pleasure to work on on this and it's it's uh, always uh i don't know, for whatever reason lately i've been working on a lot of music that hasn't been recorded before and um it's just always a, a great feeling to be putting stuff out there that that's uh that's fresh and, and that's new and that has been heard i think it's i think it's super important for classical music uh, in general to, to not just be, well, I mean, also, also for, for players too, you know, like when you're recording, um, you know, like if you're if, like for a cello player, like recording box suites or Beethoven sonatas, you know, it's like, you're, you're putting yourself in a, in a, um, in a spot that, that, you know, make, makes direct comparisons to the, the greatest, the greatest artists uh, that have ever, have ever lived in. And in, in a sense too, I, I just feel like there's real value in, in uh, in growing the repertoire and and uh, you know making making this stuff more known so th that part for me is very gratifying to be involved in a project like this to uh, bring new repertoire forward. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah, sorry, I I totally hundred percent agree with you, and I wish that more players would take that on board. Um, yeah, yeah. But also Ben Diamond says also note that Kirk has the best mic I've ever heard on Zoom, but he is a sound sound engineer. So. And I was going to oh. say that I would have to give you an award for best sound of any of my guests who have ever called in. Yeah. So, um. it's, it's, it, it's funny. It's actually a very expensive signal path. So yeah, okay. I was going to ask you what you're using so I could replicate it. But if it's very expensive, I might not. You no, know, sure. I'll be, I'll be happy. I'll be, this is actually my cello. This is how I record my cellos. So oh. it actually you know, a, a, you know, a deep bass voice. It works also well for my voice. Yeah. Uh, this is a Microtech Gefell M930. Um, it's a very, very uh, popular mic for, for broadcast for voiceover. It's uh, a really great microphone in general for anyone looking for a serious microphone that doesn't uh, totally break the bank. It's uh, a, just an amazing microphone. And, and really, I prefer it to the Neumann U87 on, on many things. Cool. Uh, it's, just, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a fuller, um, kind of more hi-fi and, and just everything that you love about Neumann microphones, um, the, the, the mid-range and just a very full low mids. Uh, that's going into a um, a hand built uh, Neve style microphone uh, preamplifier, uh, then into a DBX EQ for just a little bit of air and some added lows, and then uh, a radial compressor, uh, just taking a couple of dBs with that, and then and then into an RME UFX. So that that's how I record my cellos at home. Cool, nice. Yeah. And what uh, just quickly before you go, what mics did you use on the album? Uh, on. Hmm. It was quite a while ago that we recorded sure it. Yeah. I'm 98% sure it was the Biodynamic MC740s. Okay, cool. Okay, but I found a new microphone that's extremely inexpensive and sounds incredible on guitar. I just used it on Emma this week uh, for another video project. And I have to say, it's like a total knockout. Which uh, is? The Line Audio CM3s. Okay. It's beautiful. These are these mics are kind of well known because they're they're very inexpensive, um, uh, and 
they do a, they have a very flat frequency response. I've used them mostly for spot microphones on piano where, where I don't um, totally love them because they're, they're light on the low end, but on guitar, actually it's beautiful because it, it just doesn't, it doesn't blow up the low end like other, um, uh, you know, other car cardioids. And um, that's a great, great sounding mic for, for classical guitar. I would, I would highly, if anyone looking to get a recording setup, you really can't beat that for the money. It's uh, it's incredible. Cool. So it's made in Sweden, made in Sweden. Nice. Did you use those for these videos that you made for the show here, Emma? Or, or you... that's a good question. Sorry, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, no, for, uh, for the, uh, yeah, I used three microphones for that. I used um, uh, and they were uh, they were just off camera. So it was like uh, it was the Microtech uh, M930, um, and then the Bayer MC740s as well. Cool. Okay. Nice. So. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Now everyone can steal your secrets. Hey, it's uh, the, the, it's just the gear, right? It's uh, it's uh, it's just stuff. It, it helps. Yeah, the skill is a totally different thing. Um, uh, it's not the guitar; it's the player. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, cool. Well, thank you so much, Kirk. It's been awesome having thank you. Thank you, Kirk. This has been super fun. Thanks, guys, and uh, yeah, look forward to uh, to doing it again sometime. Nice for sure. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Take show. care. Show. Have a good day. Kirk. See ya. Bye bye. Nice. Uh, oh, let me turn my iOS camera back on. Okay, cool. Awesome. That was super enlightening. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. I can see why you like working with him. Yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Like, I, it's, it's a really great, um, I mean, he's just such a great producer. I really love working with him. Nice. Awesome. Um, quickly, before we listen to some more music and talk about another composer, let's give another skill testing question for a CD giveaway. So for anyone sure. listening, Emma is giving away uh, several copies of the CD. So the next skill testing question is just like Mario, Mauro Giuliani, who I'm sure all of the guitarists know, wrote Rossiniana's inspired by Rossini. What are the corollary pieces which Emilia Giuliani wrote and which comp composer are they inspired by? So instead of Rossiniana's, what kind of piece did Emilia Giuliani write? Uh, do you want to talk about Emilia Giuliani actually on that topic? Yeah, why not? Um, so she's um, sort of the other composer from this collection that we actually uh, have quite a bit of information about. But it's still actually, um, there's some big sort of gaps in the info. Um, so we don't know exactly when she was born. Like there's the year, but not exactly, like the record isn't really there. We don't know sort of how she spent her childhood, like in early teen years. We are not sure who her mother is, Whoa. which is like a weird situation. Scandalous. Uh, yeah. Um, but the stuff we do know is very cool. So she played her first gig as a teenager alongside her very, very famous father. Um, and became known as uh, a really exceptional performer. So when you read um, concert reviews um, from the time, they're always noting her um, incredible technical skill. Uh, very frustratingly, they're always talking about this like amazing double te uh, harmonic technique that she developed, but like there's no record of what exactly that is or what it means. It's not like notated in her music, but like oh. it's mentioned once that she's doing this fabulous thing. Um, Anyway, so she, she played with the orchestra. Um, she shared a concert once with Franz Liszt. Uh, so she was like legit, right? Like definitely a legit performer. Um, she married a vocal instructor and composer, um, Guglielmi, and uh, the two of them wound up uh, moving to Hungary together, which... Okay. Um, they weren't there for very long um, before she actually died of a putrid fever. Um, so, and she was 37, I think, so she was really quite young. Mm. So this was a like, really short life. Um, she's left us though with a number of uh, very cool pieces. So a set of six somethings, which I'm not going to mention right oh, now. Oh, sorry. Ross, uh, Ross guest. Okay, so I have to apologize to Stephen Kenyon because Stephen Kenyon got it, but he got it a second after Ross Chiasson 
two seconds earlier on YouTube said, really enjoyed that segment. Also Bellini. So Ross got it technically. Ross, they're the Bellini okay, well, They can both send me a message and they can both have a download. Wow. It's a tie. Call it a tie. Extremely generous. Okay, so both Ross Chiasson and Stephen Kenyon, you can send uh, Emma a message. And they are correct. It was a set of Bellini, like pieces, Belliniana's instead of Forsenia. Belliniana, yeah. So she's got um, the Belliniana, um, quite a few other pieces um, that are variations on opera themes. Um, so, uh, and then a set of six preludes that are fabulous. Yes, really, are. really interesting yeah. and inventive uh, pieces. And also proof think, that she was a virtuoso if those are the preludes, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and you can hear it, too, like, I mean, in her other music. The, the Belliniana, I actually find a little bit um, pedestrian. But I kind of wonder with some of those pieces if... Um, this isn't actually my own idea. I'm repeating this from that really excellent book about Amelia Giuliani that's published by Digital Guitar Archives. Um, but they pose the question, like, maybe those Belliniana were written down kind of as a sketch or maybe intended for students or something because, like, because of all these contemporary reviews saying how awesome she was, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. all these fire on stage, it seems a bit weird to have, like, some music that kind of isn't so exciting. Maybe. And then there's other pieces, like, um, like her American Dancy variations, like, which I recorded, which are like super virtuosic, like really challenging pieces. And yeah, anyway, so it's, it's interesting. There's also a kind of frustrating gap in our opus numbers. I think we have like 11 of them or something, or there's a gap of 11 numbers. Hmm. And so it would be amazing if we just sort of found 11 more pieces in an attic somewhere or something. That would be great. Yeah, no kidding. I wonder if, like, maybe the Belliniana, maybe she, yeah, maybe you're right, maybe she wrote it for her, down for her students, or it was, like, a sketch version that didn't have all of her sort of, like, I don't want to say improvised, but, like, fleshed out technical... Yeah, yeah, it's hard to know, because they're, they're just not quite as exciting as their other stuff, so I'm not quite sure what's up there. And the Racinianas are fucking big and intense, oh, yeah. so you, you would think that if she was as skilled as she was, which she clearly is, especially from the preludes, because... I opened those up and I learned the first one and recorded it on YouTube, but like some of the other ones I tried to read them and they're just like, I mean, I could play them obviously with practice, but it's not like, it's not like your usual kind of prelude pieces you can just read, you know? <laughs> like, but maybe also, like maybe the Belliniana were just like a publisher saying like, hey, why don't you do this thing your dad did? And she was like, yeah, 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 here's your stupid Belliniana and I'm going right. to get back to writing maybe yeah that's possible <laughs> you know because like the Rossiniana like uh endured in popularity like through her life as well right right and they were yeah. uh, and they were obviously like they meant a lot to Mauro Giuliani obviously because he yeah. there it's clear from listening to them that he put a ton of work into them maybe she was kind of doing it of obligation that could be possible yeah. Um, ben Diamond says, got to go now. Really looking forward to getting a copy of this. Nice to hear from you both. Thanks, Ben. See you later. And I uh, look forward to seeing your first comment next show. Um, and Brent Crawford says, very cool music. Hi, everyone. Hi, Emma, you rock. For sure. Oh, Brent rocks too. And <laughs> Rubel Das is saying, any information about recent albums? Well, the whole point of this show is the release of Emma's most latest album, which you yeah. can get in the description of the video. You can buy it. Um, oh, I had a, a, a very important question about Emilia uh, Giuliani Guglielmi, right. which is, what do you think her was her favorite food? Uh, not the thing that gave her the putrid fever. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> what was her favorite food? Um, a linguine with clams. Ooh, sounds very tasty. Um, the whole sea theme is like carrying over here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stephen Kenyon says, does Emma have any compositions? I think he means recordings by Julia Pelzer. Pelzer? Yeah, um, that's Katrina Pratton's sister. Oh, cool. Um, who was a guitar teacher herself. And um, kind of, like she was active the whole time, but I feel like she kind of stepped into the limelight a little bit more after um, Katrina died I think she was quite a bit younger but she ran a big guitar school and she sort of inherited all of Katrina Pratton's music and everything um but yeah I do not have any of her music or I haven't played through any of it anyways but I it does exist maybe Stephen knows 
more. Oh, he's also correcting me. He means compositions. He's he's looking for compos- like the actual um, scores. Sorry, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was the question. I was just like answering like a yeah. big answer. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, there, I don't know if she wrote most like. Does Steven know? Is it like mostly guitar ensemble stuff that she was using for her band? Or, like, I'm not really sure, actually. Okay, well. I do have, like, on my screen right now, basically, is like an article about Julia Peltzer that I'm supposed to read. Nice. Um, <laughs> but I have not yet done it. Cool. Um, but yeah, info, information is out there, and you can find facsimiles of her um, teaching materials, anyway, so you can, you can get it. Awesome. Um, he says she wrote relatively little okay well if someone could put a link to this stuff that would be awesome uh, or any you know information that would lead onwards yeah uh, oh and I had another question um, the piece that you recorded from one of the pieces because you recorded two Giuliani pieces um, this one Variazioni sopra il tema on the team of Non Pio Mesta Accanto al Foco, which is from Rossini's La Cenerentola, which is Cinderella story, the Cinderella story, correct? I think so. I think so, yeah. I was looking it up earlier. What's Did you look up, like, what's the text of the aria sort of about? Like, what's the sort of setting of this aria that she chose? Like, why did she choose this aria in particular? Um, I, I don't know if it had anything to do with the text, but I do know it was, like, very, very popular. Okay. Like, it was a huge, like, Rossini hit, this aria, and it's actually, I think it's in the second Rossiniana from Papa Giuliani, too. Oh, like, so there's a... Well, like, loads of people did, like, you can find for other instruments and stuff, like... Okay. used. So, again, might have been her being a badass businesswoman in some ways. Well, also, I mean, it just... Like all, almost all of her stuff, aside from the well, all of her stuff aside from the preludes is all variations on opera themes. Like she, that's that's what you took to the bank in those days. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you got to make a living, and also if it's good music, why not write variations on it? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Well, are we listening to that one? What's the the video you gave me? Uh, it's the other one. It's um, variations on a theme by Marco Dante. Oh. Cool. Do you want to talk about it at all, or should we just play it? We can just play it. Okay, let's listen to some Giuliani.
nice. Thank you. Beautiful E major, A minor cadence. Um, Ross Chiasson says, I have a question. Do you approach your performances any differently when you're using your romantic guitar? Do you tend to mic more often or do you find it carries equally well? Nice guitar. Uh, like performing with this guitar? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay. You don't perform with this guitar. <laughs> That's the answer there. Um, like basically my, uh, CD release tour is not happening because I'm, uh, sitting here in Hamilton talking to you through my computer. Yes. Um, so yeah, I actually have like not really, I don't think I've done any like performing with this guitar. Mm. Yeah. I guess CD release tours are hard to run at this time. Um, what? CD release tours are hard to run at this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have only performed on a romantic guitar, 19th, I said, should say 19th century guitar once, which was when I was studying with Daniel Bolshoi, I went to this festival and they had some 19th century guitars there and he was like, why don't you play your like nanny, like um, what's Caprice that you're playing on this in a concert for the festival. Yeah. <laughs> and I had like an hour to play the guitar before and I was like, that sounds like a great idea. I didn't realize that I was doing a bunch of shifting and I was like, my hand is the size of like half the neck, so. Yeah, yeah, it's quite different. Yeah. Um, so I guess you have to find out about that performance question. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, um, I mean, I, I don't think it would do like super well in like an enormous room, <laughs> but at the same time, like, I mean, it does sound like pretty great. And I also am not very like, uh, historically authentic. And so I sometimes put some like very modern strings on this guitar, which like, nice. uh, sort of make it pop a bit more. Mm -hmm. but, but actually, you know, I put like actual gut strings on it for a while as well. And like that also sounded great. Like nice. it's hard to know. I mean, I'm just going to have to sort of do it a bit and see what kind of like how it works in different spaces. Yeah, I mean, like, even with a modern guitar, right, you get a new guitar, you play with a new guitar, and it just feels different in every space, so it's, like, the same struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even playing with someone new, like, when Nathan and I did our tour, we hadn't really performed together, well, like, once or twice in some other circumstances, but it was, like, years apart, so, you know, it's like the first few concerts, you're kind of getting used to the new sound or whatever the balance is, even if it's not a new instrument, just with a new person, so. Yeah, I mean, all these variables are always so huge, um... Like, Sarah and I had to record, uh, for Guitar Fest West, actually, we recorded somewhere, but we were sort of, like, quite a few meters apart. And, like, that threw both of us for a loop, you know, just to hear, because normally we'd play, like, right beside each other. We're, like, it's super, like, eye contact. We're, like, breathing at the same time. And to have, like, this big distance between us and, like, hear the flute from over there instead of right beside me and, like, yeah. you know, adapt to that was just very... Yeah, Weird. You, you should try playing with a singer who has a special singer mask on and sounds muffled. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, Daniel Eustra says, bravo. Hi, Daniel. Nice to see you. Uh, and, um, oh, we wanted to pivot to another one of the composers. Who was you wanted to talk about next? Oh, why don't we talk, um, why don't we talk about Julie Fondard? Okay, sounds good. Um, because she's, she seems really cool. <laughs> it's another one where we don't have a lot of info. Um, so we know that she was a student of Fernando Sor. Nice. Uh, so he, and he dedicated a piece to her. And she probably studied with him in Paris. And that's where most of her career was as well. Um, and she was working there as an engraver as a teacher and um, also writing music. Uh, she did go to Cheltenham in England for a couple of years. And when she was there, she was also active publishing music and um, was teaching guitar as well. Like we can see she announced her uh, you know, arrival there as Julie Fondan, student of SOAR, professor of guitar. Um, and uh, we don't know like too much more about her. But we can kind of tell, I think we can tell, that she was quite uh, ambitious. Like there's a note on one of her pieces, um, like we don't have many pieces left 
um, there's not copies of everything she published, but we do have a couple solo guitar pieces, um, two waltzes that I recorded, and then a larger set of variations. And she put a note um, in with um, the variations saying that she hadn't been able to publish them in Paris because there was like a copyright issue. So it was another like, uh, uh, opera theme that she had used. Mm. And so she cleverly just was like, well, I'll just go publish it in England then. Yeah, <laughs> those were the <laughs> days, weren't they? If only we could do that now. <laughs> yeah, um, but in her notes, she put that even though it hadn't been able to be published at that time, she had made sure that copies of it were delivered to all of the important guitarists at the time. Mm. So that sort of shows us that she was like really serious about her music and about it being played on the stage. Right, yeah. Right? It's, it's like really... Um, like quite tricky music, and um, you can you can definitely tell like she would have known how to play a guitar. Mm -hmm. So I think that's basically all the info we have about her. But from that, I feel like we can kind of see like we have somebody who is like really determined, you know. So from an early age, she was seeking out the best instruction, right? Studying with Fernando Sor, she was not afraid to like go seek new opportunities, like traveling abroad to England. Uh, so she totally believed in herself, we can see, by the way, she all the time was saying, like, here I am, you know, boss of guitar, studied with Sora over mm -hmm. here, you know, like, <laughs> um, and then that she was just, like, quite determined to, you know, get her music into the hands of the people that needed to hear it. What know? also sounds like she just showed up in England and did her own thing and started something, like, you know, I don't know, like, it... No, we don't know, like, it's hard, okay. like, we don't know if she went there... With somebody, like there was a, like a Mr. Fondard that was also involved with guitar in Paris at the time, but there's no like link to know if they were actually connected. Okay. Although she was Madame Fondard, so she was married to someone. Um, so we don't know if like there was a teaching opportunity, like she was teaching there, but we don't know if she just showed up and set up shop or what, like there's just no information. But like the kind of person who would send a piece to all the important composers, even if you can't, or guitarists, or even if you can't publish it, shows like initiative, like you were saying, you know. Exactly. Like, this is someone who is going to show up in a oh, new city. Yeah, and if she moves somewhere, she's going to set up shop pretty quick and efficiently, it sounds like. I mean, this wow. is an important skill. I Let me tell you, moving yeah. <laughs> to another continent and having to learn another language and everything. I don't know. I don't mean to brag, but, like, I, I know some guitarists who have even said, like, how did you get so many students so quickly and you just moved here? It's like, well, because I actually put work into advertising and stuff. It works, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyhow. Um, that's the respectable in an artist, I think, someone who can hustle. Yeah, yeah, I think she she had a um, strong hustle for sure. Yeah, cool. But I think that's something that's just so interesting, like, to see how we can put together this kind of picture of somebody with, like, such few pieces of information. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, this is something uh, I'll talk now about Susan Domit. Um, this was so interesting for me. So I recorded um, her only far as I know, her only known published guitar work, which was um, two polkas for guitar. And all I had basically was like the music. So I had her name and like the title of the piece. I had no other information about her. I couldn't find anything. Um, and so and I was looking, looking, looking like desperately, desperately seeking Susan. <laughs> yeah. Get the reference, that's a Madonna movie. Um, so... Uh, I finally just started looking to see if she had composed for any other instruments. And hooray, I found that she had written a couple of pieces for piano. Hmm. And then, incredibly, they had been reviewed when they were published. Nice. So then I could, and then the reviews mentioned that she was really, really um, young, like a really talented young composer when these came out. So then that kind of narrowed down the window for me to look like through basically like birth records to see if I could track her down. And so I found her christening record. And then based on that, I was able to then find um, her record of death and so where and when she died. And then also I found um, a little note in, um, there was a court case that she was involved with where it mentioned she was a spinster. Um, so this sort of stuff started coming together but this, like, knowing that she was a spinster opened up a really big question, I think, because a lot of the times, you know, women would have stopped their career in order to get married or have kids, right? So then if she wasn't married, what happens? 
because we actually find after the 1840s, when she was in her 20s, she doesn't publish any more music. So I just thought, like, what is going on? Because here's this, like, really talented woman who's teaching, like, fancy people. Because you could see on her publications, it shows, um, like, who the, the, the pieces were dedicated to her students. On yeah. their, like, count and, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was a big question. And then I just very recently, like about a month ago, so I just like can't let this go. Um, <laughs> I found she became a painter. Whoa. I found um, this like uh, reviews of these exhibits where like Susan C. Domit is listed as one of the people exhibiting and her uh, paintings were reviewed very favorably. But uh there's nobody else like that would be born around the right time, die around the right time, that it could also be. So it like it has to be her. Like you just can't find any other Susan Cartwright dominance. She's the only one. And it explains the lack of compositions from that time. Yeah. So I don't maybe she was just, you know, a real Renaissance woman and had, you know, she's good at all kinds of things. Yeah, and she kind of pivoted her focus maybe. That's really yeah. interesting. Um, I was going to ask, like, is, was she a guitarist for sure? You do know if she really played the guitar a lot. Or if, if those are her only guitar pieces, is it possible that she kind of wrote them having a rudimentary understanding of the instrument but not being, like, a performer on the instrument, or...? Well, she was teaching guitar. Okay, she was teaching guitar, so she was at least proficient. And the pieces are pretty guitaristic. Okay. Uh, and then, but she only, we only have, like, two pieces that she wrote for piano as well, so it's hard to, Same. like, we can't say. Maybe she's a pianist that just dabbled in guitar for a couple of tunes. Like, or or she played both. Quite, if she was a Renaissance woman, maybe she played both quite well and taught both. Just didn't perform yeah. them all the time, right? Or, or... I mean, keep in mind, like something that um, the reviews of her piano pieces said that her works were, um, what was it, like neat and perfectly formed or something like this. Hmm, okay. And her polkas are like this as well. Like they're super compact, but they are. They're, they're just kind of great as they are right like it doesn't need more like everything she needed to say you've got in the minute and a half yeah um and and then also like keep in mind she was 20 right when this was published right so if she kept writing who knows what would have happened but i think these like the two pieces are um like they're good for like an amateur player um but they they definitely like sort of make use again like problem like they make use of the whole fretboard and uh, yeah, they're they're great tunes. Why don't we play one? Yeah, let's play. Let's do it. We have a video of um, I think it's Polka Number One by Susan Domit, and I think it's just, like, so cute and totally delightful. Awesome. Let's listen to Polka Number One. <laughs> So delightful. Da -da -da. Yeah, I just love it. And the other one is like that too. Like it's a great set, and they're—I mean—they're just like so charming. Yeah. They're great pieces, and they—they they have um, made me very happy. Nice. That and the Pratton, I feel like just so charming. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I mean, 
the you were just asking about Angelina Panormo yes. and uh, her piece is pretty catchy too. Actually, I mean, I just really like all the tunes on the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because you recorded them then. Yeah. Nice. So, um, Panormo, this is this is quite an interesting story as well. So, but the name Panormo is quite familiar to. Um, a lot of, if you're interested in historical guitars, you know the name. So the Panormo family in general was sort of all musical. They're publishers, performers, composers. And then the Panormo in question for us was Louis Panormo, who was the foremost maker of Spanish guitars, Spanish style guitars, uh, in London in the early part of the 1800s. Okay. And Angelina Panormo was uh, his daughter. And so she was not really a guitarist, although I think, uh, you know, could play guitar. Mm -hmm. um, but she was known as a pianist and uh, played concerts, uh, got great reviews. She was also singing quite often. Um, and, uh, but she was, she was really firmly in the guitar world because not only did she come from this, like, uh, pretty intense, like, guitar-making family, but she married, uh, quite young, when she was 17, she married Antoine Trinidad Huerta, who was um, a Spanish guitarist who people don't really know a lot about right now, but he was quite well known at the time. Huh. Like, and in England, it was probably like you would know Sor or you would know Huerta, right? Like, mm. he was a great name. And he's got a really wild kind of history. He's sort of, he traveled all around the world. Um, he played in um, the United States, there's a pirate ship somewhere in his history, there's like, there's wow. a lot of stuff. He also though was like, kind of bananas, like he was very, very volatile, uh, like by all accounts had a quite bad temper and we can see, um, like it's noted in the States um, where he got divorced from his first wife that he um, abused her. Um, but he also did things like he came out on stage and like when he was playing, he would interrupt his own pieces by yelling out, I am the Paganini of the guitar. Wow. Um, okay. Which is a little funny because actually Paganini is the Paganini of the guitar. But um, it's like he could play it too. Yeah. Uh, no, but um, yeah, so he was just like really like a big character. So I don't know uh, how cool that was to be married to him. But I guess Angelina and he moved to Paris. And then I've heard that they were teaching guitar there and she was teaching female students and he was teaching the male students. But like, I just kind of read that and didn't find a source for it. So I don't actually know if it's true. Yeah, um, odd. And I'm not quite sure like how long they wound up staying married, but at some point we find the record that like Huerta was married to his new wife and Angelina was back in England with the kids. Um, and then she, um, like, we don't find much information about her after that, but you can see in the census, like, up until she died, she kept her professional name, which was Angelina Huerta, and she also gave her occupation as musician, like, right until the end. So I assume she was still um, working. Yeah. Um, or active uh, as a musician, anyways. But she left... There's a couple of arrangements of popular songs for voice and guitar that she did, and then we've got... Um, and Andante and Allegretto for guitar, solo guitar. Nice. And it's another one that is just like so charming. Like you can't listen to her piece and feel sad. Nice. Like, yeah, it's really, really absolutely delightful. And it's so cool that we just have this piece, right? That just sort of shows this, you know, it's just like a little remembrance of this person that was so involved in the guitar scene, even though it was sort of a fringe in a fringe way, mm -hmm. but there she was, and she had her own like very, very interesting life, and lucky us, we've got her piece. That's awesome. Yeah, I was going to ask if there was a difference, like learning this piece, since she wasn't primarily a guitarist. I mean, obviously she understood the guitar very well, but was there a difference in the score and reading it in terms of markings or things or just... No. Just, no, okay. No, it's guitar music. Okay, nice. It was very like straightforward. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, I mean, she was just like so involved with guitar, there's no way she wouldn't know what she was doing. And I, and I believe like she was teaching guitar, she was, you know, she was married to this insane guitarist. <laughs> For sure. So, 
she was really immersed in it, even if that wasn't her primary instrument. So right, so she yeah. would know what's... So she knew what she was doing. Yeah, awesome, cool. <laughs> nice. Um, I guess the only one left is Madame de Gogny, uh, which we have a video Fabulous for. Fabulous Dolores de Gogny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's great. Um, this is somebody who we have a little bit more information about. Um, so Dolores de Gogny was born in Spain. And we don't know much about her early life, actually. Like, there's no info about how and with whom she studied guitar, when that started. Um, and we find her, um, it's her first, in her 20s, I think. I think it's 1837, we find mention of her doing concerts in Paris mm -hmm. and um, sort of touring around Europe. And at that point, she had become Madame de Gogny. She wasn't at first, uh, but she married another guitarist. Senor de Goni, um, about whom I have no information. And um, but I feel like he maybe just like was in the shadow of his very fantastic wife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so she was performing and then also publishing music at that time. Uh, and then she wound up traveling to the New World. She went to the United States where she was very, very enthusiastically received. Um, so you can read reviews of her concerts at that time, and they're just like over the moon about her incredible technique, her incredible musicality. Something kind of funny is you can read like one review where it's, um, the reviewer is comparing her, com her concert to one he heard the week before that featured Soar, Moretti, and, uh, and another guitar, like top, you know, top-notch guitarists, and they're like, oh, but you haven't heard Madame de Gogni. Like, that's where it's at. <laughs> and uh, just said, yeah, and just said she was able to, um, you know, just produce the most incredible sounds with her guitar, incredible tone. And you find this all over the place. Wherever she's playing, she's received with such uh, enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite funny, somewhere, we don't know how, but like between Europe and the United States, Senor de Goni like disappears. Maybe he fell off the ship, but like quite soon after she arrives in the States, she's playing concerts with a cellist, um, George Knoop, I think, K-N-O-O-P. Mm -hmm. And then he becomes her second husband after that. Oh. Um, and then after a few years of touring in the States, she gives up her performing career. I don't know why, but she does, um, she does compose. She publishes quite a few more pieces and it's all just under Mrs. Knope. It's not like huh. she doesn't use her previous professional name. Huh. And I think like the pieces are quite different. Like the six waltzes that I recorded that she published earlier, I think are far more sophisticated than the stuff she wrote later, which is kind of like mm -hmm. more sort of sentimental, um, I think they were written for maybe a different taste. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I read that in the liner notes and like I was kind of wondering like maybe going to the New World at that time, the level of players must have been so much lower too. Would that have had something to do with it? Could have, yeah, could have. Because like... Yeah, it could just be like a different, um, like different taste in music, who knows. Yeah, maybe, maybe again, it's a sort of business decision about like what kind of music you write to be able to sell it. Or I mean, maybe she wrote other music but just never published it, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, who knows? But yeah. she, uh, you can find all of that stuff that she published um, in the states. Um, Amaranth Publishing, uh, it's an online thing specializing in like very uh, weird stuff. Um, or not weird stuff, but really sort of obscure, like Americana guitar music. Um, so you can get all of the stuff she ever published for five bucks or something from them. That's amazing. Um, but, uh, she also has this other sort of interesting little note in American guitar history because, um, the Martin Guitar Company made their first, um, X-braced guitar sort of inspired by and in consultation with her. Huh. And it was the Digoni model, which they actually recently re-released. Cool. Yeah. So she, um, she was just, you know, cool, right? Like yeah. another just like really cool woman who uh, had this great performing career. She must have been 
very, very like a virtuosic performer. The six waltzes that I recorded um, definitely are technically very challenging. Um, although they don't sound like it. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes the stuff that's the most technically challenging doesn't sound technically challenging. Yeah, but it's, a, it's like a beautiful set of waltzes. It's really, really, yeah. they're really it also sounds like she's one of these artists who had like a really special touch on the instrument, which um, goes a long way. You can be maybe in some ways less technically flashy, although I'm not saying that's the case with her. But you can you can be that way, and still, if you if you you know get something special with your sound, that can make all the difference for captivating an audience, right? Yeah. Um, that's something that we you know sometimes forget at the expense of things like scales and stuff. Um, Okay, cool. Well, we're going to listen to her piece to end the show, but before then, I have a couple of general questions about the composers that I think you can answer, um, just to cap it off. Um, sure. Who do you think had the fastest scales? Oh, I think it has to be um, Emilia Giuliani Guglielmi or Madame de Goni. Okay, just because of the reviews? Um, yeah, because they're the only ones with reviews that sort of mention how wild their technique is. Mm. Um, and then, like, with Giuliani, for sure, we can see in her music, there's, like, some pretty hot licks. Nice. Cool. Um, <laughs> who wrote the most idiomatic music? I know it's all guitar music and all, like, fits the instrument really well, but what's the most, like, sort of immediately readable and, like, enjoyable to play from the get-go that's not sort of, like, a nightmare? Well, things that you can sort of immediately play and love and not have to practice too much are like the Susan Dahmer polkas and the um, Angelina Panormal piece. Cool. So those are those are both like they fit beautifully under the fingers and you can get them going pretty quick. Awesome. And, you know, so those are those are great. Cool. Who do you think? But all of it, I have to say, like all of it, really. Um, like some of the Dagoni pieces require like some quite contortionist moves in the left hand. Mm. And the Julie Fondard pieces are actually also like much more difficult than they sound. Mm -hmm. um, and they also like required a lot of work. But it's like the Giuliani stuff, it's hard, definitely. But it's, you know, it's very guitaristic. Yeah. Well, guitaristic doesn't necessarily mean like idiomatic in the sense of being easily playable the kind of comparison i like to give is like brower's music is almost always pretty easily playable even if it's like hard to read at first um whereas like sergio Assad's music might make a lot of sense in terms of like melody and harmony but like playing it is usually a nightmare until you've like practiced it like a million years yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah cool um who would have been the most susceptible to bouts of melancholy katarina Pratton. Okay. Oh, yeah, because the death of her husband. She published her bouts of melancholy. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole doubt. But I wonder also, I feel like maybe Amelia Giuliani might have been a little depressed sometimes. It's like yeah. soldiering on in the shadow of her father, you know? Right, Being yeah. Being like, oh, more Belliniana. Yeah. <laughs> right, Ron, more Belliniana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fair um who would be this is a question from jessica my uh fiance so who would be most likely to perform in a leopard print jumpsuit in a leopard print jumpsuit yes. me you well yes obviously but of these composers and performers um who is kind of the biggest stage presence do you think like had the biggest persona i think well i would say dolores de Gogni. okay yeah she seemed like a really, really big energy on stage. Plus, I think she would rock the leopard print. Yeah, plus when she came to the U.S., she probably was kind of like the exotic, like, foreigner who came, you know, and sort of like, I would imagine if you come from Europe to the U.S. as like this amazing guitarist, it would kind of be like, you know, you could play that up a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, and... Last and probably most important question, where is all this music published? Where is the best place for people to find it if they want to play it? Are you going to publish some of, like, new editions of these things? Yeah, I'm hoping to. Because um, some of it, uh, like, for example, the Pratton pieces I got from the Bodleian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know anywhere else where you could get them, but you can go there and get the music for sure. Nice. Um... There's, but, um, let's see, like the, 
Some of them are on the Boy Boyge website. Some of them are there. There's some stuff um, on IMSLP. There's some stuff in the catalog of the Royal Danish Library. There's stuff in the Huddleston collection, which is online. Um, the University of Michigan has a huge collection of um, old music by female composers. Um, like Julie Fondard is there. That's also, you can find that stuff online. Um, for all of the complete Emilia Giuliani works, I would get, um, and all of the information that's available about her life. There's a great book about her, um, published by Digital Guitar Archives. And then the same, um, same place has a great book about, um, it's a book about Antoine Trinidad Huerta, but all, a lot of information about Angelina Panormo is in that as well. And they include her, her pieces. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, oh, and also the the album uh, title comes from an Emily Bronte poem, right? Yeah, I was, um, you know, what I didn't want to do was call the album something like 19th century guitar music. Yeah. And I also didn't want it to call it like something cheesy, like lost ladies of guitar or right. something. Yeah, plus it's kind of like lame to sort of silo all this amazing music straight into like identifying it through like the fact that they're women, you know, <laughs> cause it's great music yeah. as is like, it's just great music. So. No, absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, it is just a collection of like, um, unusual 19th century guitar music of, <laughs> and like, we're missing a lot of 19th century guitar music, you know, no matter who it's written by. We yeah. sort of have had this idea that there's not much out there, but there is like much more than we, tons, much more than we think for sure. Um, but yeah, this was an Emily Bronte poem um, that was talking about um, like the power of the guitar to like wake your emotions. And it said, um, even so, guitar, thy magic tone hath moved the tear and waked the sigh. Nice. And nice. I just like that sort of stuck with me when I read it. And I thought about like waking the sigh as kind of um, like sort of you know, calling some voices from the past, dusting them off. <laughs> um, and then also, um, secretly, I thought about it as like the sigh that all these ladies probably gave when they just got like stepped on by the patriarchy. Again, when they're just trying to publish some really cool guitar music. Like, <sighs> or just being, you know, <laughs> looked at because of their looks and not something else. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's a wonderful album title, um, and also it's evocative of some. Like, I really I love um, the album art, mm -hmm. which is by Richard Talbot. Right, um, Richard's great. Somebody I work with a lot here in Hamilton, who just does like beautiful, beautiful work. And um, if you want to see the cover, you can. Oh, I think it's on the cover of this video, right? Yeah, like, it was the it was the cover yeah. image. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I'm really pleased with that. I mean, I'm really happy actually with the whole record because it was so fascinating for me to do this project. Um, and then I just love um, like the sound that Kirk got and I love the art that Richard did. Like it's, you know, it's a special project for me. Awesome. Uh, Kevin Manderville says there's tons of guitar music out there. Thank you, Captain Obvious. You're very true. You're very correct. Yeah, yeah thanks, Kevin. Amazing. Um, okay contribute to the talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah that didn't really contribute sorry kevin um i'm not sure did you comment on i don't think you contributed anything on his episode last time i think you just yeah i did i contributed the story about how he was chasing a goat like a... oh that was a big contribution actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> breaking a nail while chasing a goat i remember that now that was, yeah that was like the one of the best moments on the show um yeah. kevin said, only one of two broken nails in all our Colorado guitar adventures. The other one was Will Douglas breaking his nail whitewater rafting. Sounds and like... I say, like, what did you expect? Yeah, yeah sounds <laughs> likely. I mean, that's not really a guitar festival activity, but okay. Um, yeah. I'll have to talk to him about that when he's on, on the 18th, which he's the next guest, actually. So everyone um, tune in on the 18th of October for a really cool episode with Will Douglas about the Collegiate Peaks Guitar Retreat, but also about social media and guitar and stuff. So it'll be cool. Uh, Kevin says they can all outstretch like Nyani. That's all I've got. Let's not talk about goats. <laughs> Fair enough. Cool. 
Well, it's been a real pleasure, Emma. You're the best returning guest. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, the messy desk is my favorite thing on the internet, and I love uh, watching it. And it's such a great way to feel like I'm hanging out with my friends. <laughs> for sure. when, um, but yeah, it's been great. And I think you always ask like such great questions. Thank you. And it's really. Um, it's always interesting for me to chat with you. Awesome. Me too. I've learned so much from you over the years. Um, I think you've been very formative in my uh, development as an artist and guitarist, so that's really nice. Um, and also, your mom says, hi, Kevin. Hi, Janet. <laughs> hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, it's yeah. nice to have your mom support everything you do. Um, oh. Yeah, super cool. Okay, well, let's listen to, we're going to listen to the Susan Domit. Which piece is this? Um, it's Dolores de Goni. Oh, sorry, Jesus. <laughs> Dolores de Goni. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Madame de Goni, a.k.a. Mrs. Knop. Um, and it's waltz number one from her fabulous set of six waltzes. Cool. And that's going to close out the stream. So is there anything last, any last things you want to say, Emma, to your adoring fans? The adoring fans? No, I, um, I hope they um, check out the record because I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff that... Um, you know, it's good for us to know about these things. For sure. They will. They should check out the record. Everyone click the links in the description. Smash that like button. Follow all that stuff. Um, okay. Let's listen to the Nagonyi. And thank you, Emma. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And join us again on the 18th for my episode with Will. <laughs>